So thank you very much uh, for inviting me to join with you today and to partake of the remarkable collection of research papers and conversations that make up winter school. My only regrets are that I cannot be with you in Cape Town and that we continue to endure these distances and dislocations across the winter school experience. Seeing you all in that lovely room right now is both very trans uh, transporting and, and also quite bittersweet. Even though I must console myself with the recordings of these talks, given our time difference, I have to say they offer a welcome relief uh, from the isolation and the tedium of our continued pandemic living. So special thanks go to Michelle, to Haiti, Karen Brown, and all of the other organizers at the CHR for finding ways to continue to bring us all together. So my talk is entitled Switch Points of Power, Gender and Violence in Me Too. I come to the theorization of these switch points of power through a fascination with the recursivity of certain modalities of power and their enduring effect on everyday politics. In thinking about sexual assault, as well as racialized hierarchies and violence, we find ourselves confronted with phenomena that are all too familiar. As I was working on my edited volume, Archives of Infamy, first the Me Too movement exploded, and then the movement for Black Lives resurged. So as I was reading 18th century letters of arrest written by everyday people seeking what political theorist Shatima Threadcraft has called intimate justice, I was struck by their parallels and dissonance to the Me Too movement. The analogy isn't exact, those letters were largely secret, whereas Me Too is very defiantly public. But both carve out a unique claim making space and use it to generalize particular claims. In both instances, politics is not the politics of representation. Instead, politics emerges from ordinary demands for justice and thus discloses the jagged and imperfectly sutured edges of an official order that seeks integration, along with the lived experience of a stubbornly kaleidoscopic disintegration. Such recurrences of sexual and racialized violence suggest that we need to think quite differently about these scenes of subjection and the desire for emancipation that they offer. The persistence of such violence suggests that they are doing more than marking out positions of subordination. In such moments, any politics rooted in positionality becomes untenable and undesirable. After all, politics is the very effort to step outside of recursivity and the repetitions of official order and to undo the hierarchies that would structure it. Interpretively, such a politics demands constant attention to the multiple frames, contexts, histories, and archives in play. Politically, these demands seek to dissolve old relationships and limits to law, tradition, and knowledge, and to dissolve these into new assurgent uh, affinities and solidarities that would distend and transmute hierarchy. In turning to switch points of power then, I seek to identify those sites and dynamics that mediate between official political order and a new order yet to come. In the context of this talk, I will focus on switch points that are spaces of enunciation. Other switch points certainly exist and sexuality or the household or family are obviously the uh, quite relevant, but beyond the scope of my comments here today. Today, I want to puzzle through first the dynamics and then the political challenges of these switch points. In the specific in instance of Me Too, as well as the movement for Black Lives, both movements find themselves straddling the tension between their position of political critique and consideration of how to articulate any subsequent normative demands. In short, these movements confront questions about the nature and legitimation of their own authority, as well as the transformative scope of claims made by everyday people that are somehow resistant to political order. So in what follows, I will first tease out the unusual site of enunciation from which women, by which I mean those who are female identifying, uh, speak on questions of gender. Such sites of enunciation play a critical diagnostic role in identifying the slippages between putative norms of equality and patriarchal practices. 
These sites are crucial for understanding the difficulties in moving from a diagnostic to a politically transformative role, one which necessarily has a prescript prescriptive edge to its claims. Although women may speak in a variety of modes, I want to linger on the modality of witness within these spaces of enunciation. This modality is especially suited to an analyzing shifting dynamics of gender and authority, in part because it signals an interpersonal space in between those of patriarchal structure and official political order, and in part because the figure of witness indexes a complicated interplay between what is seeable and sayable about these structures of violence. Holding on to this position of witness has crucial political effects. In rejecting, quite rightly, the persistence of patriarchal practices, there is a tendency towards a staking out of claims that are absolute without attention to the working through so crucial to negotiating ambiguity and change. The last part of this talk then will outline what this working through entails, why it is so difficult, and why it especially emerges around the politics of gender. So section one of my talk is switch points of power and practices of witnessing. The practice and concept of witness has a long history in feminist thought, one connected not just to legal disputes around rape, divorce, and sexual harassment, but also to epistemological claims about history and interpretive approach. From the slave narratives of Harriet Jacobs to the epistolary genre of the 18th century, uh, to more recent work on the bystander effect, the practice of witnessing and its sometimes corollary authorship is central to upholding or challenging the status quo. Turning to the space and dynamics of witnessing builds on recent efforts by feminist scholars to recognize that gendered violence rests on particular dynamics in which patriarchal norms and entitlements become internalized by men and their female targets alike, despite contradictions to an official public order that endorses gender equality. So Nancy Hirschman, for example, finds that patriarchal structures operate as a justificatory background in parsing the dynamics behind intimate partner violence, she writes, quote, why batterers make the choice to use violence depends to a significant degree on a justificatory background, which legitimizes their desires for power and control and helps to make rational sense of these desires. The wrongness of violence may conflict with their understanding of their roles and entitlements as men in ways that they do not fully comprehend, but such background narratives can serve as smoke screens to hide from themselves what it is they are actually doing, end quote. For Hirschman then, the problem isn't that men are unaware of the wrongness of their actions or that a broader public is ignorant of these power relations. Instead, the problem lies in the displacement of power to competing incommensurable domains of authority. These domains oscillate, one now emerges at the foreground of interactions only to later recede, and both the logic and the workings of power become hard to trace. Violence erupts from the inarticulacy that this oscillation between patriarchal justifications and liberal norms provokes. Authority and authorship become caught up in this catechesis in which actions initiated and justified from a position of masculine privilege become re-articulated in reference to an ostensibly gender neutral public order. The space of enunciation opened up by the Me Too movement then marks the point of contact between these two different systems of meaning. It seeks less to render violence itself articulate than to name the conditions that contour and enable it. It seeks to halt, if only momentarily, this catechesis. Not just through the use of social media, but also, and frankly, more importantly, through the hard work of negotiating the aftermath um, with survivors of abuse, um, Me Too seeks to interrupt this oscillation. Here, the work of Tarana Burke, the originator of the Me Too movement, stands in contrast to those who have since appropriated its hashtag. And I'll say more about Tarana Burke and her work um, later in the talk. In calling attention to the hide and seek presence of patriarchal practices, those who say Me Too do not simply assess to what, to, or do not simply attest to what was unknown but true. 
They instead attest to the incommensurabilities being spoken or enacted through sexual violence, and thus to this game of catechesis. The position of witness is itself complex and operates differently in other sites. It's most commonly used to signal the reporting of events back to the law or the political act of giving voice to those silenced. Thus, witnesses may be compelled to speech before a liberal rule of law that has its own implicit rules for what may count as speech attesting to assault. Witnesses may also use public silence to call attention to those instances of sexual assault that horribly enact practices in the penumbra of the law. In this context, a vowel implicitly refers back to the law authorized by the social contract. A vowel stands in for evidence, especially in instances of sexual assault that lack corroborating witnesses. And a vowel requires that women confirm their participation in the process by making themselves legible to others as victims. The act of witness is thus what Foucault calls an element in a scene that brings forth the foundation of legitimacy and the meaning of what is taking place as a part of the judicial and penal drama, end quote. As the scope for truth-telling practices narrows, authority in these instances becomes something to be confirmed through this judicial dramaturgy. The ability to contest this authority or to enact new authorial practices seems to be foreclosed. The performance of witness in the Me Too movement, however, operates profoundly differently. Within the space of enunciation opened by the Me Too movement, witnesses seek to step out of these contexts for truth telling, so to open up other spaces. The public Me Too declarations call attention to the profoundly social pattern of practices, rules, and institutions that organizes contemporary patriarchal practices. These avowals are less confessions of intimate violence than declamations of the machinery that enables it. Both speech and silence become tactics to force the machinery to voice its own hesitations, entitlements, and tacit presumptions. Not all efforts to tactically confuse norms of speech and silence have been effective. You know, for example, the day of silence on Twitter organized by Me Too, uh, in which those harassed stepped back from that medium, notably missed its mark. What gave the social media dimension of Me Too its strength was not that it used either speech or silence, but rather the pattern of dissonance it provoked to use Rosie Bradati's phase, and that allowed it to elevate something above the constant effluence of words on Twitter. A certain drumbeat of harassment and assault emerged, one that brought an unnerving attention to the backside of power. It also uncomfortably revealed the investments and relationships that straddle both official politics and patriarchal practices. Efforts to challenge authority by seizing authorial practices thus carve out an indeterminate space or a switch point between patriarchal background and official order. Michel Foucault occasionally uses this language of exchangers or switch points to capture the instability and the reversal of relations of power. The language surfaces in his own work on everyday households and peasant insurrection. Switch points are those sites defined by fragments of power or exchanger elements between different forms of power, ones that serve as matrices for political transformation. These exchanger elements are nodal points within the circulation of power, ones that control its direction and domain. Foucault describes that these social contexts offer, quote, a matrix within which elements of power come to function, are reactivated, break up, but in the sense of parts breaking away from each other without thereby losing their activity, in which power is re-elaborated, taken up again in a mythical form of ancient forms." End quote. These switch points facilitate the transfer of power between political regimes through a conjoinment of sovereign and institutional registers. Exchangers govern the very nature of exchange itself. For Foucault, the exchanger element evokes alternately Marx, whose bearers or Tregern ease the move from use value to exchange value, 
as well as Hegel, whose account of the state rests on transformative conflicts with the state, then civil society, and then between civil society and the state. However, Foucault's exchangers are neither the playthings of alien powers nor rent by the conflicts of world historical geist. Their structural position enables them to act and to facilitate shifts in political order, but with unwitting consequences. In thinking about uprisings, Foucault refuses to locate these exchangers outside of power and instead insists on the inter interpenetration of state power and social elements. When deployed to think about gender and especially gendered violence, these switch points become a useful way to conceptualize the junctures central to the oscillation between different forms of power. They also signal, perhaps, pressure points from which this dy dynamic can be undone. They are more than relays of power. Their spatial extension forces us to understand the polyvalence of power and to examine the continued presence of old symbolic and material forms. More than points of resistance, they seek to reverse the ends of order and to use symbolic imagery to create new modes of legitimation. These relays thus direct us towards the material and discursive dimensions of symbolic forms. So think here about the family or the household and its organizational reach into sexuality, contracts, speech, and law. Analytically, these relays call attention to the disjunctures between cultural practices of what women actually do and women's legal subjectivity, as cultural practices articulate new norms that come to challenge the legal status of women. Politically, these relays charge those, those relationships that span multiple domains, say between the household and politics or the household and the market. And the effort to seize and transvalorize practices of authority will unfold in this space. These are the spaces from which alternately speech and silence can disrupt broader, broader patterns of what is seeable and sayable. The sp these sp spaces are those that highlight not just the legitimation practices that affirm the authority of official public order, but also the surreptitious authorization of continued patriarchal practices. In his marked disinterest for women and families, Foucault misses that these spaces are also ones that authorize different organizing conventions and norms that may imply very different models for political subjectivity and claim making. The letters from disorderly families, not unlike the social media posts of Me Too, detailed the, women, the movements of women and men as they assert norms of household to offer a decidedly female vision of intimate justice against a nascent civil order that will come to be organized around putatively universal subjects modeled on the male bourgeoisie. Instead, Foucault relies on a presumably shared desire not to be governed, which he takes to presume a general commitment to freedom as a moral horizon. But what if these spaces understand the moral valence of domination differently? Is something lost in the seemingly progressive uh, transformation of non-domination to freedom? After all, if domination unfolds along multiple dimensions, in the case of women, these include sexual, juridical, and political, racial, economic dimensions, then the freedom involved may include a deeper critique of politics and cultural form. As the ne next section of my talk will examine, interrupting the authoritative practices of public order is not simply a question of visibility. Although the movement's hashtag certainly has helped to expand the perceived scope of sexual assault beyond the intimacies of personal experience, the work of transvalorization itself rests less on visibility or invisibility than on working interpersonally with the play of speech and silence. After all, the space of enunciation that is the space of witnessing is not itself static. It is a switch point of exchange within a broader dynamic of relations of power. So section two, beyond visibility. The framework of switch points suggests first that the challenge is not one of making sexual violence visible or second, that it re results from a lack of knowledge. Again, switch points speak to the persistence and the recursivity of modalities of violence. The sight and speech of witnessing emphasizes the dynamics that enable this oscillation in the first place. Switch points call attention to the moral economy of spectatorship 
and attest to the relational work that is necessary to detach from this role, to wrestle with its complicities, and to confront the recursive power of patriarchal structures. In recent debates, feminist theorists have relied on distinctions between structures and agents or external and internal factors to problematize traditional categories of freedom, agency, and power. But those debates have really stalled on two points. First, in the wake of debates over the framing of agency on the terms of choice, many liberal theorists have conceded that structural conditions of gender, race, sexuality, colonialism, among others, have a formative effect on individual subjects and choice. More conservative theorists, the so-called choice feminists, insist that choices made within these constraints still amount to feminist freedom. Second, the intersection of these factors or the psychosocial experience of power touches differently on women of color who have long rejected the vocabulary of passivity and victimhood for that of enduring strength. Crucially, the figuring of sexual violence plays out on racialized lines not captured by liberal vocabularies. Neither of these two points have been fully metabolized by those thinkers who would emphasize freedom or those for whom power is determinant agency, and especially the agency of authorship, becomes caught in between, and so and agency within situations of domination becomes read weakly on the terms of resistance. Nonetheless, subjects act, refuse, forge solidarities, and revolt, and the thin language of resistance both diminishes the creative and agentive aspect of these activities and risks leaving them reactive and so risks leaving broader stu structures intact. Such a dilemma is especially problematic for feminists for whom gender's recursivity has proven to be especially stubborn and resistant to theoretical efforts to critique and rethink the terms of political community. So perhaps the lesson of Me Too is that the conceptualization of these structures has proceeded on the wrong terms. Both sets of theorists often presume that the problem is one of ignorance, if only people were aware of these structures or made judgments about them on different epistemological grounds. And yet, Me Too supporters squashed any notion that the enablers of Harvey Weinstein and others were unknowing. The challenge of thinking about structures of violence is their ubiquity, a ubiquity that does not easily reduce to agents and responsibility, precisely because it requires the complicity of multiple others who at once know and don't know. These conditions of knowing and not knowing are the conditions for learning both masculinity and femininity in the modern world, as well as the conditions for racialization. Part of what is needed then, I argue, are strategies of detachment from gendered political order. Detachment suggests a withdrawal from a set of relationships that valorize a particular order and hold it in place. To affect such work, a different set of psychoaffective attachments must be cultivated and trained. In her own work, Audre Lorde often turns to anger. Indeed, Lorde has long commented on the visibility of African American women as the very source of their vulnerability and the violence against them. She writes that, quote, Anger expressed and translated into action in the service of our vision and our future is a liberating and strengthening act of clarification. For it is in the painful process of this translation that we identify who are our allies with whom we have grave differences and who are our genuine enemies, end quote. These practices of translating anger to action and of speaking beyond prescribed social rules impugn a polyvocality to political practices that is unusual. Representational politics often is understood as the articulation of position, one that narrows the distance between who one is and what one stands for. Whether the invocation be one of anger, startlement, something else altogether, strategies of detachment differently seek to dramatize an all too visible set of practices of privilege, the effects that they provoke on vulnerable others, and to narrate these back to politics to see what can be dislodged. These practices focus on the political enactment 
that it emerges across the play of claims, counterclaims, retorts, and retreats, a drama that is not reducible to individual persons. Lord's naming of this process as a translation is critical. It signals the gap between personal experience and political strategy, between feminist practices and theories, between action and critique. Such translations will necessarily be imperfect. They seek not to marry reality with representation, but to work within this space so as to, uh, to urge those circulations of words and deeds that might redirect the circuits of power. One way then to think about the Me Too movement's relative silence in response to the question of, well, what next, is to think about what affective work this detachment entails. The movement's emphasis on absolutes and the refusal to say, well, some men are exceptions, forces men to express their doubts, which are then met altern alternately with public rancor or silence, don't make this about you. It keeps pressure on men to identify their own complicities and to wonder about the hidden pleasures taken in knowing that somewhere a woman is being beaten, but they, hopefully, are exonerated. Such hidden desirous economies, theorized first by Freud, permit a superficial disavowal of violence and exploitation, while leaving intact the affective attachment to those hierarchies and the order that they sustain. Part of the work of detachment must attend to the knot of internalization that attaches participants to normative and political structures, despite their avowal to the contrary. Social roles cannot simply be replaced wholesale. They must be negotiated and worked through, and in a way that revises the particularity of those roles, that is, how it is that they are enacted by specific men and women. Third, and relatedly, the work of this detachment must acknowledge the specifically racial economies that simultaneously traverse these authorial practices. Discomfort and unacknowledged racial differences are one reason for the constant oscillation between systems of meaning around questions of gender. Experiences of sexual assault for white as compared to black women are differently visible. Such differences differently map onto state and police power and whether these institutions are perceived as allies to be rehabilitated or as predators that secure ostensibly social hierarchies varies tremendously. Finally, the terms of collectivity and its symbolic forms must also be re re reworked. Authorship is not an individual project. This work is the hardest to undertake since such symbolic forms are powerfully anchored in conceptions of desire and sexuality, the family and power. Against these symbolic forms, the Me Too movement has relentlessly turned to repetition to enact over and over the oscillations described earlier. Once again, the framework of witness is helpful. Its success relies on the willingness of participants to endure uncomfortable silences and refused responses so as to take up the labor of working through and revision. The work of witnessing is not that of redress or exculpation. Perhaps the impetus of authorial practices then is less to institutionalize than experiment with a variety of modes of authorship, each differently invested in a bigger democratic project. Across many co contemporary social movements from Me Too to the Movement for Black Lives, there is a notable resistance towards any concentration of power or authority at the top of an organizational structure. Instead, the emphasis is on power sharing and decentralization. That decision emphasizes a politics rooted in dissensus, both within movements and among them, a dissensus that would make authority something in need of constant challenge circulation and affirmation. From its inception, the Me Too movement has really struggled with the circulation of its own authority and its citing as something at once particular and having a broader reach. Many became of the hashtag MeToo movement through its circulation on social media as hashtag MeToo. The hashtag's popularity nearly erased the history of Toronto Burke's 2006 MeToo campaign, one associated with her nonprofit Just Be and its work with survivors of sexual violence. 
political transformation is the work of a ceaseless traversing you know, of the, the space between visible and erased. And the work of moving different authorial practices into new domains to see what challenges they inspire, but also to think about what it is that they are actively shutting down. Attention to these spaces of enunciation, their de desirous investments, the relationships that span them, captures some of the present unevenness of their terrain. Uninflected by the teleology of a putative progress, fragments of different political orders continue to half organize perceptions, interactions, evaluations. No wonder debates quickly emerged as to whether hashtag me too reflected revolting millennials, where even the meaning here of revolt could be contested. Individual responses reflect less a generational divide than heterogeneous adaptations to power from different times. This heterogeneity ought to push the Me Too movement then to ask what guiding principle could be used to assess the movement's uh, growth and collective ends. Should it appeal to freedom, but understood as the freedom of agents or the desire not to be governed so much and in this way? Or contrary to Foucault, it might recognize the weakness of that refusal to be governed and instead it might draw from the writings of Angela Davis, Patricia Hill Collins and others to recognize that the organizing norms for black women in the United States are survival rather than freedom. And that enduring solidarities rather than universal citizenship takes pr uh, priority um, over any reference to an earlier band of brothers. Black women's contribution to survival is dismissed in two contradictory ways either by redirecting Black women's work towards the family unit in support of a dominant man, or by dismissing Black women's strength as debilitating towards the family. What are the lives of Patricia Hill Collins's Outsider Within or Gloria Anzaldúa's Border Crossings or Bell Hook's Margins, if not the experience of lives lived within the oscillations of these switch points? All of these are efforts to understand the social relations that result from a range of phenomena, including migration, decolonization, civil war, and the long shadow of institutional slavery. Absent appeals to alternative models or to any guiding political or moral principle, it becomes easy for new authorial practices to appeal unreflectively to the community. As the MeToo hashtag spread, demands were made to exclude alleged offenders from their posts to disinvite them from public engagements. And initially these refusals appeared as a powerful tonic. After all decisions about which speakers to disinvite, which contracts to revoke, what new practices to implement will be made at least partially within institutions. But here there is a tension between publicity and institutional process. By their nature, institutions consolidate a diversity of experiences into a single policy. Institutions parse responsibility, guilt, and punishment according to the logics of notice, contract, and accountability. Responsibility, guilt, punishment. These are a powerful range of claims, counterclaims, affect, and ways to define and enforce the boundaries of community. The merit of an institution, one might say its authority, comes from its ability to move back and forth between official policy and specific circumstances. That is, it should strive to walk the line between the avoidance of personalism and the violence of depersonalization. In the presence of inadequate or corrupted institution, it's tempting for others to step in and to render judgment. And to be sure such interventions are sometimes the catalyst to institutional overhaul. However, such absolute demands also obscure the conflictual prehistory of the formation of this new moral community and its own ethical principles and practices. Unexamined, these may include exclusions of their own. These questions especially must be raised against our current carceral context, one that privileges best practices that increasingly seek to intervene before the commission of any acts, favors autocensure, and uses punishment as a way to reassert dominant order. Bluntly, claims to indisputable moral authority have an infamous prehistory and demands for punishment 
may contribute to the carceral politics decried in other contexts. By way of conclusion, I would argue that the Me Too movement straddles a divide between advocacy and prescription. Its racial interventions are uneven and uncertain at best and risk avoiding a sharper scrutiny of norms and practices around security, political power, and exploitation that are often powerfully racialized. The movement is at its most powerful when it simply refuses to enact the usual complicities that muffle speech, that demand little of official politics or cultural bystanders, and so reenact and reproduce the patriarchal practices that operate in plain sight. By exposing the contradictory truth-telling practices of official order and patriarchy, and then keeping the emphasis on those contradictions, the Me Too, Me Too movement has made it hard for these reenactments to be recognized as anything but farcical. In doing so, however, supporters of the movement have leaned hard on the practices and principles of official order, an order whose liberalism most of them sharply critique. To show up the contradictions, they have valorized um, or at least condoned the promise of equality central to a specifically liberal politics. What comes next is crucial. For these authorial practices to be more radically transformative, they must translate this interpretive authority into the dismantling of other political and economic structures, in short, their contractual logic the structures that hold these relations of domination in place. The real target for transformative claims lies in seizing upon an as yet unconventional symbolic form and making it incontrovertible for further claims to democratic authority. But such per work is performed rather than legislated. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, Nancy, and it's wonderful to have you back with the CHR virtually uh, at Winter School. It's, it's always an honor and a real treat to receive your, your thoughts, your words, your work as a scholar. Um, and if I may just say welcome to uh, Professor Karen Brown. We didn't have the chance to welcome you at 10 o'clock yesterday morning. Um, but we're delighted that you joined us and we can experiment in this strange hybrid part in person <laughs> um, uh, way of being together, not together. Thanks, Nancy. I, I think it's a, this was an, an incredibly rich, uh, a very rich talk because you disentangle and make kind of thinkable a very complex set of considerations around um, the kinds of politics that movements that could be called hashtag movements um, kind of uh, animate and 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 also set loose in a way. Um, and I, I think that's um, you. So, so I, I have a question about the, um, I guess, the switch point. Um, and now I'm thinking about uh, Susan Buckmorse's recent book on revolution today. Um, and her, her I, I mean, it's a straight, it's a, it's a beautiful kind of, it refuses to be a form that one can necessarily kind of define. Um, it's not a manifesto, it's not a, a kind of a proposition. Um, it's mainly images with a little bit of text, um, but it seems as if she's almost getting to something uh, to, she's kind of adding to towards a horizon that may be shared with um, with what you, if I understood what you said with what uh, you're saying, which is that the switch point is somehow a, a site for um, an insurgent, emergent political subject, but, um, but its provisionality and its 
in distinctiveness or it's or not that was the word you it's in in stability in some way um makes it quite hard to it, it isn't yet uh insurgent and it doesn't yet produce a kind of a collective political a kind of vision or demand um across even though it you know there's um you know, she talks about the um, anti-femicide movements, um, LGBTQI plus struggles, um, anti-racism movements, uh, the uh, environmentalist movement, particularly in the contemporary kind of. So I, I was wondering if you, to, you know, wanted to ask you if you could say more about, you know, how you're thinking the switch point as a certain kind of trope for um for politics that that I, I, I don't want to say emancipatory or make a big claim but you know that that might open into to, towards that kind of um or might, might make that gesture and more and the second question i had was um you know uh the the witness kind of has a very interesting genealogy in South Africa, mm. both in terms of anti-apartheid prison narratives, in terms of anti-apartheid narratives, especially um, a, 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 kind of a feminist anti-apartheid narratives. Um, and I'm, if, I, if I wasn't um, kind of in a brain-melting uh, state, uh, I'm sure I could access some names, perhaps colleagues around me could. Um, the struggle is my life. I mean, I'm just thinking of, anyway. They, they, um, and then, of course, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission kind of presents and, in a sense, um, co concretizes, although I think that's, that's too hard a word, but the witness is, you know, is, is a passive, almost de agentic and depoliticized figure um, is able to somehow kind of narrate through testimony um, and through the different categories of victim and perpetrator, um, and I'm thinking particularly the victim category, um, in ways that, that kind of tame the wild edges of some of the possibilities of you know what the the speech of the witness can do um and so yeah i was just interested to hear also to hear you say a little bit more about this kind of um the political the, the agitation that the witness makes possible because here you know sitting in south africa it's quite difficult to imagine that because of this kind of Overdetermined, but also made passive figure, often woman, often woman attesting to the loss, the torture, disappearance, and uh, so on of loved ones. Um, so yes, yeah, so I was interested to if if you could say more a little more about that. And the third, if I may, um, chair. <laughs> okay, I'm being disciplined by the chair's gaze. So I'll hold off and let others, um, and I might return to my third link. Thank you. Hello, hello there. Um, Rwanda Scott here speaking. Uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, really provocative ideas and thoughts. Um, I've got also maybe, maybe two, maybe three uh, questions. I'll try to be quick as possible. Um, we've been talking, um, uh, you know, the, the earlier lecture today, the first lecture was on um, the scroll and the archive. And so that is sitting at the back of my head as I answer this question about uh, the hashtag, particularly, of Me Too. Uh, in South Africa, there was uh, uh, Am I Next uh, hashtag. And so my question is on the hashtag and Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. So social media and social movements, right? But some people have been calling uh, click, click activist or, um, um, and so, and I wonder about if you can speak about 
um, that and, it's, it, and also how how the hashtag moves right it moves from the United States into so there's a kind of global um, a movement that the hashtag does um, and I'm wondering also if this is the future of activism I do, you know um, so so there's that there's also uh, you spoke about um, gender and violence gender um, Gender violence becoming adopted by both men and women in society. Um, and then, and I was wondering about, you know, the convergence of the conservative, um, uh, you know, different, different conservatives or different people who wouldn't necessarily align, but align in this particular, aligning particularly when it comes to gender and sexuality. Um, and, 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 and here I'm reminded particularly of yeah, the trans figure, right? The ways in which, you know, trans exclusionary radical feminists, right? Kind of, so there's a convergence, there's, a, there's, there's certain agreements, right? When it comes to gender or certain kinds of groups. This happens in South Africa as well with kind of the traditional, you know, whatnot. And so I wonder, as you spoke about power, right? But also instability and how it moves, uh, it moves around, thanks. Uh, I have to say I'm reminded once again of uh, the magic of winter school and just these remarkable conversations. And I am also extremely glad that I have the advantage of it being morning and I am fully caffeinated <laughs> because otherwise I'm not sure I could keep up with you all. Okay, so let me see how I can start to answer and think through uh, these questions, which are both, you know, just uh, fabulous. So in starting with Haiti's first question, you know, in thinking about Susan Buck Morris's you know, recent book um, and you know, the way that it functions as a kind of rejection of form um, or, or, or literary genre, I haven't had a chance to look at the book. So first of all, thank you for the, the recommendation. But off the top of my head, I would say that the way that you are describing her book as this juxtaposition of images and text, that it is um, very much reminiscent of what Foucault is doing in uh, Disorderly Families, where he's publishing, you know, sort of a curated collection of those letters of arrest written by ordinary people in the 18th century. He described the project at different times as one of decoupage. And so you get the sense that he was working with those fragments of text, you know, almost as if putting together a kaleidoscope or a collage of some kind, and was interested in thinking about, you know, the kinds of questions, contradictions, and so forth, um, provocations produced by their juxtaposition. And so it's interesting thinking about you know, the vast range of letters that could have been published. There's some, I think 75,000 know, that were eventually circulated across the 18th century. And he published 93. You know, and so that's a tremendous reduction you know, in, in numbers. Uh, and you know, it then highlights the instability of the text because it makes you realize that it's not a question of reading 93 or 293 or tens of thousands as a way of trying to understand what these texts are communicating. There's a way in which they are attached to a very inchoate and nascent vision of public order, which means that in some sense, they're fundamentally going to remain illegible. And so they shift a huge amount of burden then onto those you know, who are the readers of such text to think about, well, what am I going to scaffold up in order to encase and to make sense of these different fragments? And how am I going to try to engage with them? And will that engagement be one where I shut down the instabilities of the text and try and make them more stable, more discernible, more apprehensive? Or is there a way that I'm going to try to stage manage a conversation about their instability, but then that forces the recognition that that conversation is really one that I am creating and taking responsibility for and interpolating others into. And so I think, you know, in that sense, you know, what Buck Morse might be doing, what Foucault and this other project does, what's happening in Me Too, is very, you know, deliberately trying to push different accounts of personal experience together on the page or on Twitter 
to see what comes from that particular friction, you know, and, you know, then it creates a tremendous amount of interpretive work, journalistic work, political work, institutional work, you know, to really think about, you know, what comes next. For Foucault, then, he wants to connect this kind of interpretive work, you know, with these, you know, switch points of value. And you're right that it becomes hard to quite know what the figure of the insurgent might be and how to grapple with the provisionality of such a figure. <laughs> because that seems to undermine any effort to organize collectively. It seems to undercut their authority or their ability really you know, to, to circulate. But part of what I think is central to thinking about these switch points of power and part of what I think Foucault misses is that there is a very much, and then these, role, these figures are very much embedded within institutional context that themselves have the possibility of fragmentation. And so I think ideally then, you know, what happens in, you know, the face of, you know, these letters of arrest or Buck Morse's, um, you know, collages or, you know, the hashtag circulation, you know, of Me Too is you start to see people making use of these fragments as a kind of wedge in a broader context. And for them to do so effectively means that they need to start instantiating or calling into existence a different kind of collective and to really rethink the role played, you know, by these institutions. You know, for me personally, when I think about the Me Too movement, where I become very frustrated with it is when it becomes these acts of de declamation, denunciation, where it just turns into a desire to shut things down and walk away. Because, you know, I find that to be politically very uncreative. Um, and because it doesn't take into account, again, this kind of play between, you know, personalism on the one hand and its violences, but depersonalization and the violence of depersonalization. So Me Too personalizes, which sometimes can call attention to the way that institutions are for profoundly <laughs> impersonal and don't really articulate where a, an emergent society is now headed. And yet I also don't want to live in the world of personalism and, and retribution. For me then, what's very different about these switch points of power rather than thinking about just some gap between agents and structures, which is the usual way that feminists have thought this problem, is that the temporality is quite different. And so what it means to think in terms of these exchanger elements, these fragments, you know, or, you know, these switch points is that they are fragments from different times and from different symbolic orders that are in a, a kind of state of oscillation with one another. And so, I mean, for me too, on the one hand, you have these moments of outrage where it seems like, okay, there is some kind of tremendous jolt to existing social order that's being provoked. And then within a couple of weeks, you slip back into the way things have always been done. And so I think, again, when Me Too is effective, it's not, you know, simply speaking the language of declamation or simply speaking the language of what next. It's trying to call attention to what allows these oscillations to continue and what is the work of suturing that might be necessary if we have these fragments of different symbolic order that are starting to be juxtaposed to one another in new ways, that are starting to form some kind of assembly or decoupage that are we're trying to get to do a different work, you know, in a, a different kind of, of context. And so in that sense, you know, to get to your second question, you know, about um, witnesses and the role that they play, you know, as, as passive, you know, this is where I think, again, you know, part of what I'm hoping to do, you know, with this particular, you know, talk and, and, and research is to think about how to really push back on that way of thinking about witnesses, that way of thinking about TRCs, where there's this, I think, very naive notion, you know, that if people just, you know, you know say what happened, then the truth will out, you know, will be able to um, relieve, you know, the pain, you know, of, of past historical traumas, you know, and then to move on. And if anything, I think what is seen in many TRCs across the world is that those witness testimonies 
testimonies both are feminized, but they become another way, another bargaining chip between opposing sides. And so they become incredibly politicized. We'll let so-and-so testify if you, if you release a captive that you're holding, you know, in the context of the civil war, you know, in, in Congo, for example. Uh, you know, and so I think, you know, that to the extent that this mode of witness can be one that participates in a different way of bringing speech and knowledge and power together, you can provoke a different sort of effect. But it's really only going to be valorized by the follow through, you know, to what extent is there some kind of more specifically collective and institutional response that comes next that's going to rewrite the relationships that are being organized by the old order. And if you don't have that collective and that institutional moment, you know, then, then, I, then I entirely agree. You have this kind of collapse down into you know, the abject figure of the witness and not a lot of, of actual change. Moving to the other questions that focus more specifically on um, social media and movements and click activism. You know, thank you for those questions. You know, they're uh, really terrific questions and ones that I need to think through and to grapple with. You know, much more directly than I am than I am currently. Um, I'm pretty skeptical of, of click activism and that simply adding a hashtag or changing the way that you know your social media account appears for a day or a couple of days. You know, is really activism in any kind of a of a meaningful sense. Uh, and I uh, don't think it is the future of activism, except for one key feature, which you alluded to in your, your question, which is the change to circulation. You know, and this is where I think what really matters is finding a way to bring different people into different conversations with one another, and especially to think about how to put a kind of pressure on institutions and on power holders, and how to help people share information globally about the differences between their different movements, you know, and, you know, the kind of histories that, that, that are attached to those. So for example, you know, the Me Too movement, you know, in France is very differently connected to police violence in a way that it isn't as explicitly in the United States. And it's very much caught up in France's refusal, you know, to acknowledge much, much less own up to its continued role in colonial violence, the way that the police in France were always mediators between the treatment of colonial subjects in, you know, the metropole the treatment of immigrants and, and so forth. And so there, I think there have been a lot, not well, there have been some fruitful exchanges between how to think and to organize around those particular kinds of issues, but also some recognition on the part of the movement for black lives and those organizing in metropolitan France, that race in those two countries means something completely different. And for France, it's very much connected to a history of imperialism and colonialism, whereas in the United States, it's connected to institutionalized slavery and that those histories have pulled in different ways uh, and have interpolated um, sexual violence and assault in different ways. And so I think that there is a lot more that needs to be done to really work through the particularity and the specificity of those experiences, in part because as your second question, you know, turned to, there's ways that, you know, the place for gender and sexuality in a lot of these movements can be at odds with one another, and especially around, you know, trans figures and trans activists. Again, my hope for thinking about these switch points of power is that they become a way to focus on pressuring institutions and the ways that institutions respond to power. They also are a way to try and think about then how to target, you know, shared um, uh, adversaries, let's say, rather than trying to adopt some kind of more comprehensive um, political position, you know, across a range of different movements. Uh, I think that's just not possible, uh, not because it's idealistic and utopian, but because power touches differently on people in different contexts, and that has to be acknowledged, and that has to be argued through. 
And so again, in, in thinking about these switch points of power, I think there's a different attention sometimes to tactics and strategies about which tactics are effective and then how can that be folded into a broader strategy. It should force some uncomfortable conversations, especially about you know, whose needs are being tended to first, which is a perennial problem, you know, in thinking about, you know, the feminist movement, and again, allies across racial and across sexual lines. Uh, and so again, I don't think there's a ready answer as to how to resolve those kinds of disputes, but it provides a context for thinking about what can we have these disputes elevate so that they're not understood somehow as subverting a particular political position, but actually are part and parcel of the politics that we're trying you know, to really shepherd through um, you know, in moments of tremendous transformation. Um, thank you for those provocations. Um, as Jane would say. Um, I'm at a point of the day where I'm quite tired and used a lot of English. So it is quite possible that I might have misunderstood you at some point, right? Um, but I'm asking these questions just to, you know, just for us to align, but also if it is that I'm aligned to you, um, to just find out what you think about, you know, what I'm expressing, right? So, um, as you know, as Lando has started, I'm, I'm I'm also thinking about the scroll, right? And I'm also thinking about the archive. I'm thinking back to the conversation that we had earlier, right? Um, thinking about also the fragmentation that exists within, you know, um, the social media space, and especially in relation to um, movements um, like your new tour, like your MI Next, right? So you know, there is fragmented pieces, you know, are being, you know, put out there, right? And what I want to ask you is, do you have an imagination, right, for stability in the... No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Let me finish the question first. <laughs> <laughs> do you have a okay, brilliant so, question? <laughs> calm down, guys. <laughs> do you have um, have you thoughts? Um, <laughs> have you thought about maybe a, a possibility um, for um, stability um, and in the insurgency, right? And the, re the reason why I'm asking you this is um, what you have said to me has taken me back to some work that I did in my master's, and I was uh, focusing on 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 Chimamanda's book, um, um, almost said crime, but it's not, that's not it, um, <laughs> um, Half Yellow Sun, right? And in Half Yellow Sun, they, you know, there's an exploration of memory and trying to put memory together and, you know, working with the pieces um, to put a narrative together. A collected narrative to, <laughs> um, you know, to make the whole, right? And so, and thinking about that, right? Okay, and thinking about that, I see a lot of value in that, particularly because, um, you know, the, the story keeps getting broken down. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it keeps, you know, getting broken into, right? So, 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 um, it, it, <laughs> okay, maybe it's, um, so, it then, it, <laughs> Interrupts, uh, it, it interrupts the you know the, the narrative in, in in making it a whole, and then you also you spoke about like the suturing, which is like a possible way for us to uh, you know to get to that um togetherness or that you know um collected sense right um in terms in terms of the insanity itself. So I was just thinking about that, and for me, um you know the fragility that exists in the suturing. I think it is so important, right? I think it is it's so important because of contextual placement, because what that then does is that it, 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 it speaks to the fact that this thing is happening. And if you're speaking about what we use oscillation, like the moving back and forth, it speaks to the fact that it's happening, it speaks to the fact that it has happened, and it speaks to the fact that like, continuously, you know, this thing that keeps happening. So I see a lot of value, right, um, in, 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 in that suturing, um, as you call it, right? Um, it, you know, in the construction of the narrative. So for me, what I'm thinking about uh, um, the Me Too movement, when I'm thinking about the fact um, that this advocacy, this kind of advocacy exists online, it makes me happy <laughs> because I'm seeing work 
you know, towards this, towards addressing it. And yes, of course, um, you know, like it, there's a suturing that's happening because it keeps getting broken down to because, uh, into because of, you know, the structure that it's speaking against, which is so violent to it that it keeps wanting to interrupt it, it keeps wanting to, to break it. So the narrative then doesn't come together as strongly, do you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. um, I just actually, as my initial question was, I just wanted to find out what your imagination is um, in terms of creating this insurgency in like a collective or collective way. And, and thank you for, uh, you know, for, for, for posing it to me. I think it does a remarkable job, you know, of opening up, you know, both how it is how I have an imagination for or not the sutures and so on. And I love that formulation. Uh, and it also forces us to ask hard questions about two things. The first is about stability and the second is about, you know, uh, historical trauma. And the way that I think, you know, that these, you know, switch points of power or these fragments force us to ask hard questions, you know, about stability is because it obliges us to acknowledge that, Instability is profound, is a profoundly vulnerable moment to be in. Um, it touches on people differently. Um, and that many people who find themselves to be in contexts that are characterized by instability or vulnerability profoundly do not want those contexts to remain that way. And so I have a particular allergy to a certain strand of contemporary um, theory, you know, such as those theories associated with William Connolly, for example, um, who draws quite a bit on Deleuze and Guattari, who want to embrace a kind of fluidity and stability, contingency, et cetera, as a way of saying if there was just a more of an openness, both in terms of individual dispositions, but also in terms of politics, well, then we'd be able to find our way through this complicated moment. And I just think that's entirely false. Uh, again, most of the people, you know, for whom I think, you know, politics ought be directed in the name of are not embracing contingency, instability, unpredictability in that way. It shuts them down. So then how to think about, you know, these particular, you know, switch points uh, and, you know, the fact that they are unstable in some ways or differently put that they're provisional. You know, this is where I think you're absolutely right to raise, you know, the question then of what's the nature of the sutures, you know, what would it mean to start suturing together um, in the space of these switch points, different fragments or different ways of thinking about symbolic forms that have this very archetypical presence. If we start to think about the family or the household or about sexuality, I mean, these are symbolic forms, you know, that have so much history behind <laughs> them. It's not as if we're going to generate new ones, you know, in the space of a week, a year, a decade, even. It's going to be the work of, of, of generations. So how to think about that? You know, and this is where I think the language of suturing, you know, it again is an effort to rethink and revalorize the language, you know, of wound, you know, and of trauma, where oftentimes those are seen as being moments of vulnerability, of victimization, you know, of passivity in some, in some way. But when we start to think socially, you know, about wounds and about trauma, and we realize that we can't just move that language from a personal experience to a social experience, then we can start to think, you know, about, you know, wounds or trauma as something that has an edge to it. And as something that around those edges, you know, that those involved become drawn together. They're not drawn together because they share a vision as to what is to come next. They're not drawn together because they think that that experience, that history has the same meaning or the same weight you know, or the same implications, but they're drawn together simply by the fact that they, that history is shared even as it continues to divide them. And so part of what it means to start thinking about sutures, you know, or switch points then is to think about what can, what work can be done to try to draw together the edges of, you know, that trauma or that wound with the recognition that it's going to hold for some period of time but we might need to undo some portion of it 
or it might get ripped open, um, or it might heal, but heal in a way that we can't entirely see or understand or fathom now in the moment. And so it's a way to try to acknowledge that something is provisional and that we are working through and trying to revisit you know, relationships that have a history of violence to them, but with an eye towards knowing that what might hold might only hold for a defined period of time before we realize, oh, we need to put in new stitches or we need a different way of grappling with whatever it is that we're enduring and bearing with you know, together. The second um, way then you know, that I think this, um, your comment directs me in really helpful ways is to start thinking then about, well, what specifically is the nature of historical trauma and what's the temporality of thinking about trauma? And this is where I think historical trauma, again, is very distinct from the way that we think of personal trauma as something that's often repressed or denied or, or covered over. With historical trauma, there's often a very sharp break you know, between the past and the present, in part because of official efforts to disavow what happened, but also because often those who lived through something profoundly don't want to talk about it, or it has a very different meaning and a very different symbolic resonance you know, for them, such that there isn't really a, voc a social vocabulary that allows for it to be spoken about, you know, or that allows for those words, for those images to circulate in a meaningful way. And I think that we oftentimes move too quickly from thinking about personal trauma to just scaling it up for a social level. And we forget that there is this intergenerational component to historical trauma that is really important. And that one of the kind, one of the harmful or injurious stabilities that historical trauma can bring with it is a kind of repetition, you know, a repetition of, of events that happened in the past that aren't acknowledged, worked through, that don't circulate in the way that we're talking about here, and that come to be, you know, um, enacted in part because the society has grown so used to accommodating them that you accommodate to those violences. You allow them to, you know, continue to persist on in, in daily life and in some way or another. And so one of the, and the context of a very different article, you know, I've been working with this notion of the pluperfect errand, which, you know, acknowledges that oftentimes, you know, those who experience some kind of historical trauma, you know, act towards other people, act towards the next generation in particular, in such a way that they inadvertently start to prepare that generation to have certain expectations and not others, to open up some potentialities and not others. And always through the language of be careful about this, watch out about that, but without in fact naming what happened or the referent. And so then, you know, in younger generations, you see an unwitting and inadvertent reenactment either of previous traumas or of efforts, you know, to redress them. And I think that's partially what's bound up into the kinds of oscillations that I was talking about in the talk that I gave today. And so again, for me, this is one of the reasons why focusing on those oscillations and not just having a stand for or against them becomes so important. It also becomes a way of thinking about, you know, the specific kind of pain of recovery, you know, that comes from having these sutures in place, having to undo some of them, having some of them ripped out, you know, and then, you know, having some of them heal, but maybe heal with a kind of scarring or in a way that is, that is inadvertent. Uh, so, you know, in short, you know, I think by, by thinking differently about trauma, stability, and history, I think that we're then able to move away from a kind of temporality of change that is very teleological, where one thing, you know, one symbolic order exists and must be condemned, but then there needs to be a clear articulation of a new vision for the future, who is to organize it, you know, and towards what, what ends. Uh, you know, I just don't think political and social life, especially intergenerational life functions in that way. Thank you, Nancy. Um, so I have, I have two half-baked questions, or one question that has two parts, perhaps. Um, under, the, under the broad frame of um, 
what you just walked back now in your answer, you, you were talking about it depends where it goes, is, is, is a formulation that you use. And um, within that frame, I wanted to ask about switch point. And I wanted to ask about the play you have between freedom and survival mm -hmm. at one point in your talk. Mm -hmm. So, so for switch point, um, and, and to put to put my cards on the table, um, you know, my question also comes from a um, a, a criticism of the black consciousness movement from the left in South Africa, which was that being black is not a political program. In, in other words, the implication. It doesn't go anywhere. Um, so, so switch point, right? Which is this instability that you that you're talking about in your in your talk. Um, you know, it's it's a very evocative uh, concept. Um, you know, where the line changes, um, but also where the where, where the switch hits the body, right? There, there's also a welt. There, there's a there's a point of beating in the switch point, which which I wonder if you if you could think about as, in a way, on the body you would have a welt, you would have a screen. So there, there's the beating of the body, um, and then in the hashtag it's thrown back, in a way. So 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 I'm wondering if there's something to think about that act of putting that welt back into the social, so to, so to speak. And then on the, on the other, and, and the figure in the background for that question is also Motley and his reading of the scream in Black and Blur. Um, and then the other side of my question is freedom versus survival or freedom and survival. And I wonder about survival as an act of freedom. Um, you know, that, that a person survives is both a defiance and itself a ground of freedom. So, so I wonder if those two could be thought in relation to that question of where does it go? So thank you for, for, for uh, both of those questions uh, and uh, for pushing me to think, you know, a little bit differently about switch points. So the, the word, so part of where I, I take this concept from and then rework and elaborate it, you know, is from Foucault, where the word is échangeur, which refers quite literally to a kind of junction box that directs, you know, how, where electricity flows, you know, across different circuits. Uh, but I like the, the reading that you're proposing here, in part because it captures, you know, something that I, I think is central to the work of switch points, which is that they, in, in considering them as nodal points, they are located within particular domains, but then move up, you know, to touching, to, to touch on institutions, to touch on discourse, to organize those. And they also move down to start thinking about political practices and ethical practices of subjectivity and, and disposition. And so, you know, for me, somewhat like you, I think I share a great reluctance, you know, to begin thinking about politics, you know, from, you know, the position of the individual subject and from claims, you know, about consciousness, because I think that that disavows, you know, again, just the heterogeneity of people across, you know, any political community. But importantly, these are people who are differently situated, who have different histories, and who interact and interface with institutions in different ways. And so there isn't really a way to try and think of a model of, of subjectivity that could speak to that range and particularity of experiences, you know, and those who appeal to, I think, again, fluidity, contingency, and so on, I think, wind up thinking about individuals on terms that become so superficial, and so, you know, um, dependent on a kind of liberal subjectivity, that you really lose, you know, the political traction, you know, that they're seeking, you know, that they're seeking to get. And so with switch points, there's a different way of thinking about the indeterminacy where attention is really on, well, who is touched by these switch points? Who is um, who becomes activated or reactivated and how are they differently put in conversation with or inserted into institutions, discourses, et cetera. And so in thinking then about, you know, what does it mean, you know, to really 
um, linger on the word switch and to think about the will on the body. I think that becomes again a way to underscore that even as we might very reasonably and importantly feel the need to start thinking on collective terms, that again the way that people participate in experience and the the um, the pers uh, perspective that they bring to such movements is necessarily going to be quite various. Uh, I think that oftentimes within movements, at least within the United States, there is such pressure on the need to be efficient or effective, the need you know, to have coherence, et cetera, et cetera, that it becomes difficult to find a vocabulary to articulate this, the process really of being in movement. And so it becomes difficult to step out of of a kind of neoliberal vocabulary around utility, efficiency, effectiveness, you know, et cetera. I think then that also makes it hard for those who are in movement with one another to recognize you know, that you know, members are going to have different expectations. They're going to be pushed and pulled in different ways by the aims of movement. And that those are resources really to try and work with rather than um, internal cleavages to be tamped down or you know, to be somehow kept under wraps. In terms of thinking then about survival, you know, as as freedom, um, and what are the possibilities for this, you know, here, you know, when you were, were speaking, the phrase that came to mind was from an abolitionist, Mariame Makabe, who says, "We do this till they free us." where there isn't this question of choice or who is the ideal political agent or what is the right consciousness or what am I interpolated to, to, you know, to do. It's, this is an activity that is ongoing. This is you know, a um, thing that we do because we couldn't otherwise exist in the world if we didn't do it. And we will continue doing this until there's something that fundamentally budges in the way that relations of domination play out and extend you know, through society. And so you're right that there is a way that it becomes both a, a process as well as an end goal of sorts. I think it makes it possible you know, to, to recognize that oftentimes freedom has needs to be disaggregated, you know, that it's not experienced um, in politics and society and the economy in simultaneous ways that reinforce one another. Oftentimes, you know, if we were to think about the Haitian Revolution, for example, you see, you know, the, um, the achievement of political freedom, but within a colonial economy of exploitation where domination very much, you know, still continues. But I think that it's important you know, to think about then how to disaggregate that language of freedom, both to adjust expectations. So there's some recognition you're not all relations of domination are going to disappear simultaneously. I think there is also a somewhat different need to think about how there is a freedom expressed and demanded through opposition work um, that is opposition to official order, even as there is also a different substantive view of freedom that is being worked out by those in movement. And that those are two different strategies towards both experiencing and um, seeking after a different kind of specifically political freedom. I think part of what um, activists right now are starting to recognize is because of the interpenetration of you know, political institutions, you know, economic uh, modes of organization, and social movements, it, it's difficult to know exactly where to start. And so again, this framework of switch points becomes a way to start thinking about where do we see a fissure? How can we move upwards to put pressure on discourses and institutions? How will that differently activate downwards New, uh, you know, new members of a movement, and then what happens when we take that experience and try and reinsert it in a different context? What works? What collapses and fails? How can we somehow um, accommodate, you know, for that different context? Uh, and in the process, see this as a mode of survival, you know, as a way of not pining after a kind of simultaneous self and political liberation, but it's, you know, the ability to find joy and pleasure even, you know, in, you know, these, these um, experiences of, of a kind of defiance.
Thank you very much, Nancy. Uh, that is the end of our session. So again, thank you for being with us. And uh, I'll see if you can hear an applause from the mic. As I <laughs> Well, thank, thank you all, all so much for the invitation. I know how exhausted you must be because I know just how long the days of winter school are. And it gives me just so much pleasure to be able to see your faces. And uh, I wish very much that I were there in person uh, to continue to share in the conversations. And I'm excited to, you know, now having heard all of the references to this morning sessions to go back and to be able to, you know, to watch the recordings.